It's darkness, about half past two in the morning, and something inside of me tells me that that is what life is. Life is half past two in the morning. That cold dread that a new day is starting, that you are going to have to go through that day as well. Welcome to the Daniel's Nemesis podcast, reading X Story. This is X Story, an addendum to X Book. X Story comes after the final chapter of X Book and before Holly's epilogue. You may be thinking, but didn't he? And for the other character, but hadn't he? And yeah, this is after that. No matter what has been said previously, the ending of X-Book has always been troublesome for me. Never satisfied with it, I always believed that the way X-Book finished was right. It just wasn't satisfactory. I could never understand why the ending should have been right, and I could never understand why the ending wasn't satisfactory. Yet... Extory was an attempt to fix some of the very clear issues with the ending. If not the issues, at the very least to justify why they were there. In fact, one thing that it definitely doesn't do is fix any of the issues. It just repeats the exact same things. Less justifying, more reinforcing with blunt force. That isn't to say it's not without its revelations. Fuck, a triple negative. It has some revelations. Extery was written in 2002. Extery stayed in the main novel for a while, but was eventually removed. I think I wanted it to be its own separate story. However... The draft of X-Book that I have been reading from for the podcast has x included. I guess I wobbled on whether or not it deserved to be included as part of the main novel. Tonally very different. What is interesting is that x does create a new style that I was to borrow heavily in the next novel I wrote. The story of Iris Phillips. You'll have to wait a while for me to get to that novel, as I intend to read another first. X squared. Too many X's, I know. And a couple of the details from Extery creep their way into X squared, making Extery canon in this universe that I created, regardless of its inclusion in the main novel. Extery delves much more into a surreal universe, that isn't parallel to a main universe as X-Book contrived. Extery's universe is very consistent. I'll give you some warning, though. Extery does have a lot of very late teen, very early 20s male angst and obsession. Sorry, I shouldn't generalise. My own angst and obsessions that I had in that particular era of my life. If you want to identify with any of this, I can't stop you, though seek counselling. It's a long one, very long. And remember, this is fiction, always fiction. Logic is as logic does. X Story, written by Daniel's Nemesis. And she tells me that her name is Holly. I cannot help but laugh at the irony that I can never escape Holly. That this girl is so evidently not Holly. That she does not look Holly. Yet I make her Holly. I never did find Holly. So why does she appear in this girl? Because I make her Holly. This is where I depart because I will find this girl again, this non-Holly Holly. But I cannot leave. The door is closed. It is locked. So I need the key. 
but where will I ever find the key? And in the room, the only thing that is visible is holly. The walls have vanished. A floor, a ceiling, the decorations, the people, the air. I turn around, but the door is there. I turn again, and non holly holly is there. So where is the key? And yet, I will never know. I walk again to non holly holly. She is the key. Somehow, not her, but somehow. I ask where the key is. She tells me she cannot go alone. That is the only words that I will ever hear this girl say. Can I escape? No answer. Where is the key? No answer. Can I escape? No answer. Are you Holly? No answer. Are you not Holly? No answer. The key to open the door. But it is not here. Not here, so where? She stares at me. She looks at me. She never acknowledges my existence. The key. There is no key? I try the door. It is gone. I decide to stay. I find the key, but it does not matter. For every door I go through and every room I enter, she is there, this non holly holly. She will be there forever and ever. Yet for some strange reason, I cannot ignore her. I am attracted to her. My gaze just finds itself focused in on this one person. She is there, yet I am here. I am looking at her, yet I doubt she will ever really look at me. So why are we here together? Why does she seem to notice me and then not notice me? In that first room, she could sense my presence. Yet every room I go into after that, she seems to drift further and further away. Yet she will always be there. She will always be wherever I am, it seems. I decide to go back to the first room. I want to confront this. I need to confront this non-Holly Holly. I have to talk to her. I have to find out who she is. So I go back to the last door I came through. It's not a matter of I can't get through. It's a matter of the door is not there. I spin around quickly. I glimpse a door and I run towards it, hoping that it will not disappear. I insert the key and I'm about to step through before I realise that this is not the door to go back. It's the door to go forwards. Yet there was no other door. I try to step backwards, but I still manage to be pushed forwards. There is no going back. As soon as the door slams shut, I spin around to try and go back through. Yet it is not there. The door is not there. There is one other door, but I refuse to go through that. Every door I go through takes me away from her. My mind is just on her. On her. On her. I can't get my mind off her. My mind is on her. I want to scream, go away. But it comes out as secretly coded messages that she may not be able to hear, but perhaps her unconscious will detect and understand. I sit down on this floor. I have nowhere else to sit. And it is only as I sit down that I become aware of the floor's presence. I guess there always was one. It just felt like I was walking on air. Why do you do this? Be with me. Be with me. Be with me. The music is playing the right song, yet I am going through the wrong motions. I am alone. Suddenly I become aware of people. People everywhere. 
people all around, and there is no escape. People barging into me. People kicking me. People I scream abuse at as I crane around to see, to move, but there is no room to move. There is no way to see. I am lost and I am confused and yet every step I take just gets me more infatuated with this non-presence in my life. I don't know who you are! I've said that before, but I don't know your name. How come I can see people that I know who know you, yet I do not know you? That makes no sense. Can you not see? I deserve you more than anyone else. No, that is not right. Can you not see? I am more worthy than anyone else. Is that right? I don't know. But it makes no sense that I can never know you and other people can know you. Why? Is there still a door? There is no exit. Why can I not know you? I can see you there, right now. Yet I do not know you. I want to leave you now. I want to leave here now. But everywhere I go, after a star has helped take me away from all this, you invade my life. I see images of you here, non-Holly Holly. Visions of you there. Thoughts now, and memories then. Life is played out in a way that I will never truly live, only experience. And it seems totally right, yet strangely wrong and different. To be able to reach out, but you won't be there. That is the way that it happens, repeatedly, again and again. Why? 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 There is no why. It is happening. Everything. Now. Then. There. Everything. She's there. She's always there. And I always run towards her. When I leave her, I go back to her. It's when I close my eyes and she is there, coming up to me, telling me that her name is Anna. It's when I open my eyes and she's gone. It's when I close my eyes and she tells me her name is Cheryl. It's when I open my eyes and she's gone. It's when I close my eyes and she tells me that her name is Rachel. It's when I open my eyes and she's gone. That's when I miss her. That's when I notice that she's not there when I want her to be. So I walked down the road and she was not there. She walked past me once and stared straight into my eyes, almost stopping to check to see if I was me. But it doesn't happen this time. It's when I walk through the place that she works, but she is still not there. And I want her to be there. I can go home, knowing that she won't be there, yet knowing that that won't stop me from seeing her. And sometimes, when I close my eyes, I feel that she may be there, watching, listening, but not being there. But I drove through town and she was there. Yes, she was there on the pavement. And as I craned around to look at her, and you looked around too, and our eyes met, though I do not think it was conscious. And you see me, and I see you, and I carried on driving, and you carried on walking. That is that. I'm going out tonight, and I know that you'll be there. It'll be different from last week and the many weeks before. We've always been together, though in different groups. Last week, I took a photo of your back because it was the best shot I could get. Today, who knows what will happen, but you're not around, though I go off looking for you. I cannot see you. For the first time, 
a sense of relief washes over me, as I know this was to be the last chance, and it's gone. You're not here, and that makes me happy. But then I see you, and you're wearing a revealing top. You go to the bar, and I follow. You go off, I stay where I am. Later, I'm dancing, and once again, you stand nearby. I get a photo of you, a sneaky one, but a good one, I hope. And this is where I know the obsession has to stop. And I get angry when you're around, and I do not want you to be around. The time is now, but I do not want it. I walk away. I go to the bar. You follow. You stand behind me. I get my drink. The barmaid talks to you, says your name. And that is when I want to cry. I have to run away because I know your name. Now I know too much about you. I have to stop this. I can't help looking out for you, Jenna. You have an identity now. I can find out more about you now. I can use your name now. You are more than just a face now. It is wrong. It is all wrong. I still can't help wandering around looking for you. Yet everyone I know seems to know you. Why? This is not fair. This is not fair. I can do whatever now, but I won't. I can't. Once more, we are together. I keep coming into contact with you. The joy I feel is distorted, rather than a touch filling me with sensuous delights. It makes me laugh at you. You, who have touched me. I am disgusting. I am foul. I am putrid and nothing. Yet, you touched me. Ha! <laughs> who would want to come into contact with me? Yet you have. And once I came into contact with you, that makes me happy. That makes me vengeful. That makes me wrong. But when I am leaving, I still want to see you. I still want you to be there. But I know, when you walked past me, out of the doors, that was to be the last time I ever saw you. Because the moment I walked out of the doors was the moment that time stopped. So might it be? No, I don't think so. But what can I do now? Time has stopped. I can walk back in through those doors, but what will that achieve? There is something wrong here. But what can I do? I do not feel prepared for the next steps that I now have to take. I know not what steps to take. Where do I go from here? I look at the doors. They are closing now. Closing for good. Forever. They were the past. This is the present. The ever real present. Time has stopped. I don't know how to make time go again. I turn around and I walk away. I just sit down. I look at a clock. All I can notice is the way that the hands have folded downwards, touching the floor. I pick up a hand. I try to put it back, but it won't go. It just flops back down. A part of me wishes that if time has stopped, that means I can go backwards. That is just a small, insubstantial part of me. The rest of me wants to sit here for the time being, but to ultimately move on. To go out there. To do what needs to be done. It's darkness, about half past two in the morning, and something inside of me 
tells me that that is what life is. Life is half past two in the morning. That cold dread that a new day is starting, that you are going to have to go through that day as well. The overcast sky blocking out any starlight, creating a roof, providing no means of escape. The air moving, the light gone. Your mind is numb, tired. You can't think straight. Cars driving past, going somewhere, and you are just walking, trying to catch up with the world as it zooms by. The lights in buildings are off. You envy those people in those buildings. They are asleep. You are awake. Life is half past two in the morning, with its promise of the future. But for the present, you just want to sleep. And I am walking. I don't know particularly where, but I feel like I have an idea. It's where I know I will have to end up. It's where Holly is. But I don't particularly want to go there. I want to go elsewhere. Yet I know there is only one real option right now. I feel sometimes that I have a poetic soul. I know that to be bollocks, really. It's nothing. Nothing thoughts from a nothing person. I know that at some point I'm going to watch my death again. I know at some point I'm going to try and find out who I am. I know at some point I'm going to utterly traumatise myself. I know at some point my mind is just going to be utterly blank. I know at some point I'm not going to be here. But that is another point in time. One that is not here yet. I know I'm reveling in a misery that is only my own. I know that I don't have to think these thoughts. That I can make them go away. I know I can do this. I know that I'm a normal human being. I know that I'm capable of being who I want to be. But it doesn't stop me from being who I am. And right now, I am the only person here on these lonely streets. I'm not the only person. These streets aren't really lonely. It's only half past two. It's just that everyone is isolated in a time that I no longer seem to be a part of. Frozen in the act of walking home or moving on elsewhere. Going to get some food or stepping into taxis. They are there. I am there. Yet I am the only one here. They just seem not here. Part of the scenery. An object, not a life. Something to avoid whilst walking, like a lamppost. Right now, we are together in this world, yet I am the only one sharing it. Yet, Godspeed. I Godspeed. can hear the words Godspeed. in my head Godspeed. right now. Godspeed. Just Godspeed. 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 Like Godspeed. that. Godspeed. The words Godspeed. become dissected. Peed. Slow God. down. P. Each syllable God. is allowed to P. play itself out, God. to get across P. its full God. flavors. P. The words are God. cut up. P. Two groups God. of four, D four groups of two, e. backwards. Deep stock, deep stock, deep The words are there Deep stock. in my mind, deep stock. hovering deep stock. over conscious thought, God. repeating e. and repeating and repeating. God. Godspeed. E. Eight letters. God. It's lost all meaning. Speed. It sounds wrong. Unnatural. God. I cannot recognize it. It is only God. a word, yet it feels like a sound with no ideas God. behind it. Peed. And a hand picks Peed me dog. up. I have Peed called dog. something. The Peed hand dog. takes me into the Peed sky. Dog. 
but I can get no further than the cloud cover. I am placed on the side of a building. I am left to hold on to the sides of the walls, like a spider, but without the powers. I can feel gravity pulling at me. Another hand from the ground, no bigger than my own hand, but it pulls at me. It just pulls at me. And I know there is no option for me. I have to fall. But this is where the problems start. Because I can only fall once. I can only land once. Yet I seem to do this last part many times. When falling on my head isn't good enough. When smacking into the floor, shattering all my bones isn't good enough. When landing on my feet and falling backwards isn't good enough. When spinning over and over again, hitting the floor head first, the momentum of my body snapping my neck backwards as the body hits the ground and breaking my neck isn't good enough. I find myself on the floor, dizzy, undecided as to what just happened. I'm just lying on the floor, the backward Godspeed still floating around and around. I want to close my eyes. I want to sleep right now. I want to dream. I want to be asleep. But no matter how hard I try to close off my mind, I'm still thinking. I'm thinking about non-Holly Holly still. I'm thinking about Holly. I'm thinking about how I have to get to her. I'm thinking about how could it ever work? I'm thinking about how I feel trapped in my mind, trapped in my body. And I scream at myself. I just scream at myself. I want innumerable bad things to happen to me. I scream at myself to be someone else. I scream at myself to be able to allow someone else in. To allow someone else to come in and fill up this hollow, hollow space that still exists within me. To fill it up. To know that there is someone out there, someone that won't get bored of me, that won't leave me, that won't reject me. The screaming stops. I never opened my mouth once. It was just in my mind. But I am still telling myself just how much I hate myself. I open my eyes and the real world shines through. It is still only half past two in the morning, and I have far to go. Why London? Why of all the places in this country, let alone this world, why go to London? Because that is where Holly is. But what will it achieve? What will it actually do? Nothing. But at least I'll see her again. At least I know she'll be there. But then what? Then I'll make a decision when I get there. I'm too afraid to face up to that part of it just yet. I'll push it away. And so I have no option but just to walk. Already I'm out of High Wycombe. It's just fields and grass for a long time now. And it's got lovely sights. Just black curves against the black sky. I'm having to climb up a long hill, and I know the songs that I want played at my funeral. In fact, there are lots of them. The majority of them are very upbeat songs, joyful songs, happy songs. But one of them, one of the ones that is at the very top of this list, is a very sad, slow song with no lyrics, just sorrowful violins over a sad, soulful, sighing type sound. It's a beautiful song. It makes me cry every time. Or at least, it would make me cry if I could cry. 
Instead, it's just like a numbness that is so intense. I can't feel a thing, yet I know I should feel it all. I guess I can't face up to it. But how do you? I don't try to be ironic with these songs. I'm not trying to be funny. I'm just being true to myself. These are the songs that make me feel about who I am, what I will become, how I will feel when I die. And yet, that is only the future. This is the present. There are hills to be conquered first, and this is one of them, although it is deceptively flat. I am of the distinct impression that I am currently climbing up a hill. My legs are heavy. My body is tired. I am out of breath. It is becoming a struggle just to move my legs. And yet, light is dawning. Light is dawning? I do not understand. If there is light dawning, then surely it is not half past two in the morning. Yet I know that it is. And now my head is beginning to spin. On top of my confusion and my tiredness, my head is beginning to spin. If a new day is now dawning, and this is no longer now, but another time in the near future, surely I am running out of time? I must hurry, surely. I don't know anymore, because anything I do just makes me feel sick. I know I must stop, and I just want to rest to fall back and lay down, but I cannot. I am running out of time, and this urgency requires me to run. I want to run. I seriously want to run, but I do not feel as if I can walk anymore. I am dizzy, and I think that I am beginning to tremble. I start running anyway. I just feel like I am continually lurching forward, losing my momentum, stumbling. I am falling from side to side, as dizzy enough as I am. I have to run faster. I have to sprint. And I sprint. But although I feel like I am running as fast as I possibly can, I am so tired that there is no actual momentum. I am moving slower than if I was walking. I have been here before. I have done this so many times, it is unbelievable. Yet here I am again. I collapse to the floor, and now the world really starts spinning around me. My stomach is churning. I am gasping for breath. My mind is purely focused on this one desire to get to Holly. It is midday. The sun is burning down on my back. I am crawling for all I am worth. I have to stop, but when I stop, my whole body wants to kick out to not be still. I am crawling, and I am making better time than any other method of moving than I can think of. I almost have no idea where it is that I am trying to get to. The same tree zooms past me at least five times in the space of about ten seconds. Why is it daytime? It's not supposed to be daytime. I feel weak. So weak. I am trembling again. It is the dizziness making me tremble. The tiredness making me tremble. The heat making me tremble. I don't know if my arms can support me anymore, but I have to keep going. I try to stand up. Surely that must be better than crawling to reach you. I get onto one leg, but my body just collapses as my leg cannot take the weight. I fall to my side, and I am being sucked into the ground. The ground is taking me away, and I have to dig my way out. 
I am losing oxygen and I can't breathe. Surely this is not the way. And my legs are kicking backwards in the biggest panic of my life as I am suffering claustrophobia. My legs are kicking backwards with a life of their own. My hands are scrabbling forwards, pushing minute bits of dirt behind me as I slowly creep forwards. I have no idea how far underground I am now. But my lungs are expanding. My lungs are on fire. My hands are just scrabbling on rock and bleeding. My nails are scraping the rocks, sending shivers along my spine. My legs are in a fury. My lungs, my head is dizzy, can't think. Nearly there, can't tell. No air. Dead. The biggest rush of air into my lungs. I choke on the oxygen. I can't breathe in. Have to wait for my body to sort out what is already in my lungs. Slowly, cough air out. Breathe in again. Can't breathe in. Slow down. Air into my lungs. Out. Gasp. Gasp. Pant. Pant. And so on. It is night time again, half past two in the morning, to be precise, and I am just lying here, breathing. Non Holly Holly is here, again, and she is next to me. I don't know. All I know is that I regret all the mistakes I've made in the past towards her, and this time there will be no mistake. She has her arms reached out mid-dance, and I just put my hand on her left arm, my right on her waist. I am standing behind her. We start dancing, although our steps are out of time with each other. Is that symbolic? I put this forward to her. She laughs. Then we are not together, but I am just standing beside her. She is always beside me right now, and then we are on different buses. As mine pulls away, outside of the Brinteg Lower School, all I know is that this is the last time I will ever see her. We have window seats, so that each of us can see each other. And the bus is pulling away, mine. And I want this moment to last forever. This is the moment that I will see her last. This moment that I want to freeze. I am still in this moment, and I try to linger here, but it is gone now. That is the end. The end of an era. The end. Goodbye. The end. I wake up. I feel like my head is expanding right now, my mind rather. I feel that there is not enough room inside of my head in order to keep my mind contained. My mind feels restricted. It feels constrained, trapped, cluttered, confused, messy. My head feels full up, but I don't think that there is anywhere for my imagination to go. I stop looking outwards. All I can see now is my own head, my face, staring blankly back at myself. It's foggy and nothing seems clear right now. There are little words and sentences zooming around the inside of my head right now, passing by each other, but with no definite location to go to. My brain feels heavy and it seeps out. As I look at my head, all I can see is just my mind expanding outwards from my head. Two little bubbles protruding from the sides of my head, expanding like balloons. They are white. That is all I can see of them, though I cannot see into them. But I can see clearly into my mind, the inside of my skull, 
and the barriers are still there. Trapped in the middle, stretching from one side to the other, is just the word mind floating in the middle. I can see clearly now. All the confusion has been sucked into the balloons outside. All the excess thoughts, doubts and worries, all trapped in these bins. Everything excess and superfluous about my day-to-day -day thoughts have gone, and I can see clearly. But all I know is just how small the inside of my head is. How it cannot be big enough to carry all this weight around. My thoughts should be pure. They should be simple, as this is the only way forward. Just mind floating there in the middle of my head. If only it could always be like this, but instead the bubbles contract, my brain fills up, and I can't clearly make my way from one thought to the other again. The fog has returned and yeah, I'm stuck in the middle again, looking out from my head. I have noticed now that I have wandered into the approximate area of one of my old girlfriend's burial site. I decide that I need to go and find her grave. I feel that I at least owe her that much, as I have not been around for the past 80 years or so. I'm not 100% sure of when she died or how she died. I am not 100% sure of the person that she became after I left. But I know that this is where she was buried. Finding the graveyard, I go to her grave. I find it, but it is not hers. I do not understand that. I have nothing with me. Nothing that I can place down at this grave. All I can do is just stand at the grave, looking at it. I wonder about her body. I wonder what expression did she have on her face when she died. I wonder about her last thoughts. But that is difficult, as I have been so distanced from her for too long. I try to imagine her body still in the grave. I try to imagine it still in the immaculate condition that it would have been buried in. But no, that is unlikely now. Like a memory that fades over time, I know that a body also fades over time. What is there left of her, other than her name on records to say that she existed? Even the gravestone that stands at the top of her grave is blank and empty. She had no children, no legacy to pass on. Other close family members are also dead. Am I this only link to the past now? Did she ever exist? In all truth, I cannot remember. I can remember a name and a body, but no face. I have always been told that it is best to not imagine her face, but to recall a time, a moment, with which to capture the expression, the soul, the life upon her face. That should bring the memories back. But I can't think of any. Were there any? Just a figure that is no longer with us. No knowledge of what she was like. No knowledge of who she was. People who walk by this grave will never ever know who she was. Just another member of a civilization and a time that has passed and gone. I have nothing to put on this grave. I feel I owe something to this person, regardless of whether it is Dee Dee or not. I feel I owe something to everyone in this gravesite. I feel I owe something to everybody that has died. Those who have achieved, those who fought for causes, 
regardless of whether they would ever see the light. Those who discovered. Those who lived and bred. Those who made choices. Those who were forced to live their lives in accordance to others. But right now, I feel I have to do something for the memory of Dee Dee. I take off my watch. I place it down on the foot of the grave. She may not live on in life, but she will live on in time. That is the gesture anyway. I have to walk away now, and I try to imagine the lives of all the graves that I pass. My only regret is that the grave I went to see could have clearly stated Deirdre Carling. I look back at the 2.30am graveyard. There is light sweeping over the graveyard from the sun burning directly above. Well, not quite directly, for the graves cast shadows. The shadows stretch until they connect with other graves. Somehow, they interconnect. They are joined as one. There is no longer any single unit. There is now a grid. I can only wonder at the memories, the stories, the lives that flow from one grave to another through the shadows. I close the gate behind me. A graveyard really isn't for the living. As I'm walking away from the graveyard and I'm thinking about the past, I try to work out how it relates to the future. I realise how the meaning of life is not just constructed by what we do today, but also by what has happened at any time in the past to make the present what it is today, as well as a desire for a safer future. Our own safer personal future. Safer personal future. But the future is compromised. Always compromised. I have a desire to hide. I just retreat behind some bushes, and all that I do is watch the sun go by overhead. I watch the sun rise in the morning. I watch the sun set at night. What goes through my mind, I guess I don't really know. These are mechanical actions. The momentum of life. A blankness. Vagueness. Yet, there is this undying restlessness. All I know is that I should be doing something. Going somewhere. Living my life in a different manner to the way that I live my life. I am disgusted by myself. I am full of hatred towards myself. It is so simple to be able to turn my life around sometimes, I think. And yet, I never really seem to try. I never really seem to be able to put the changes into place that I really feel need to be done. Like what? Like my desire to be more sociable, to be more organised, to be healthier, to spend less money, to stop putting myself into the most stupid of situations, like I always do. And then the inevitable happens. I finally have to face up to myself. I approach myself, facing away from the sun, a silhouette, my shadow, stretching out towards me from the low sun. I approach myself. I get up to meet me. All he does is just face me and look at me, staring into my every single nuance. Just looking at me, looking for my soul trying to look as deep within me as is ever possible. I don't know if he will ever find what he is looking for, but as I do the same to him, I find a blank, impenetrable wall. How do I begin to
to talk to myself. What do I have to say? I don't know how to talk to myself. Maybe that's another problem that I need to address, but I need to make myself more approachable. I look at that face. It does not deserve a mind like it has got. The face looks pained, as if it wants to be separate. I know what goes on in that mind. It is evil inside, insults flying, intense visions and thoughts, and just a vague nothingness. Yet the face says none of that. The face says it wants to be happy. The face says, take me away. I want to take it away, and I reach out towards that face, and I do my best to tear it from its head. When, finally, I am able to take it away, I try to put it on top of my own face. But, although I am looking through different eyes, I know that nothing has really changed. My perception of the outside world is still exactly the same as it ever was. But whilst my counterpart stays ever the same, I realise that I am growing younger. I am going back to a teenhood dominated by peers and rejection. To a body that refused to love me and a mind that refused to love my body. Yet, I am calmer, although sadder, inside me. The fury that plays itself out in my life is not to be there yet. Instead, I have to face up to friends who always run away. The lies and the deception that they spawned as I trusted them. To those who offered me help, yet only served to drag me deeper under, as I failed through their blind methods to aid me. To the wonder that, did they ever care? I regress further, back to a time when there were good times and I was not sad. Then I go back to the ultimate time, to the time when, for the first time, my body decided to ignore the needs placed upon me as a figure in this society, in practically any society. As I stand there in front of my other self, and I learn to separate myself from his self and everybody else, I learn that the mutilated figure is the real me. This is the me who was created and put onto the earth. This, all I can ever be. My body is mutilated and horrid and impractical. But this is my supreme self. This is the measure by which I will always regard myself. And in my childlike ignorance, I am happy. With this refound knowledge, I walk away. Now, perhaps, it is my turn to walk away, just as others have done before. But this time, I know that is something that has to be done. This is not time for games, not anymore. And as I turn around, I can finally see the lights of London, the destination of which I intend is held within those very same lights. Once more, I continue on my journey, and with an inspired hope, the way seems relatively easy, with nothing about myself to slow my progress down. I watch the sun's rapid progress as it makes its way down the sky in a matter of seconds, random cloud patterns flickering during the process. My shadow that was once long has now diminished to nothing, died its death in the shadow caused by the earth itself. My body makes its return to its older version, and I am back to who I am again. 
I take the other me's face off of my own and I throw it away, leaving it discarded in a bin somewhere. I look around me and notice that the majority of cars have crashed, their drivers poised in a state that is unnatural to a crash. Their bodies are still sitting, though perhaps not on the seats, instead of the sprawled mess that one can only expect. I look at London and realise that 57 years after its last stand as a war zone, it has returned to that state, in appearance, perhaps, rather than politics. I need sleep now. It is, after all, half two in the morning. Visions. Vicious white lights. People I have not seen for a long time. Endless wandering, lost and alone. Tiredness and struggles to go on. I awake. It is about noon, I would possibly say. I look at a clock. 2.30am, to be exact. There is only one way to go now, and my journey is coming to an end. However, I must carry on, and I pass endless people. People, all just frozen. I look people in the eyes. They do not look like the eyes of someone unalive. They look like the eyes of someone alive. There still seems to be a warmth, or a bitterness, or anger to the eyes of those that I look at. I wonder if I can stare into their souls. I wonder if the eyes really are the windows of the souls. I stare long and hard, but all I can get is the surface emotion. Try as I might, I can't get through to the thoughts and feelings that go with the way that people look. For instance, if I look into her eyes, I can see that she is sad. But what else lies underneath? Why is she sad? Does she feel to blame for her sadness? Is she angry at herself or others for allowing this sadness to come on? Does she privately revel in her misery, looking for sympathy from others? Who is to know? Not I. I carry on walking, but soon I come across someone with their hand in a lady's bag. Not believing that it should be there, I pull it out, realising that it probably makes no difference now. It just makes the world seem that little bit better. Applying this logic elsewhere, I decide to pull away some of the people who have been involved in the traffic accidents all over the city. Again, not believing that this is going to make too much difference. It just feels like it makes the world that little bit more right. Yet, when I come to these bodies, that's all that they are. I notice that in comparison to these bodies, the thief's hand was extremely flexible and supple, whereas these bodies are just stiff and really seem to contain no life in them. Even their eyes, finally, have that glazed over look that I found in none of the people on the street. I guess these people have actually died, even though they were involved in accidents after time has stopped they still managed to die. I look at the sun. It's slowly starting to set. At 2.30am in the morning, that seems a bit early, but then, perhaps time never stopped. Only life did. But then, why am I still walking about? I don't actually understand what's going on. I only understand that finally, I am here. I have reached my destination. I go in, not totally knowing what to expect. What should I expect? I know not. After a moment's anticipation, as I go in through the door and look to the stage, I finally see her. 
She is there, centre front of the stage, crumpled on the floor, just like everyone else is in the room. This is a magic moment, I'm well aware of that. But, to be quite honest, I don't really know how to handle myself right now. This is a magic moment, and I cannot help but just gaze at her. She looks so lovely. I'm too afraid to reach out to her. Much too afraid. I'm too scared even to take a photo. I'm just sitting here, looking at her, admiring her, wanting, desiring her. But I am becoming aware of something inside me. Thoughts and feelings that are stirring themselves, pushing their way to the forefront of my mind, slowly. Firstly, soon, it is all going to be over. Everything is going to be over, but soon this will be over. I will walk away, not wanting to, but walking away without anything having happened. The moment is not now, but it is in the near future. After all, I came here. Why? Just to be here. Because here was the only place I could be now. But soon, I am going to go, and the only place I can even think of going will be back home. It seems like a nothing thought, perhaps, but the dread of everything seems to crowd that one thought. Secondly, looking at her slumped body, is she really any different? Really? No one can even begin to understand the picture that I have built up of her in my mind. To me, she is like the ideal of love, a perfect being, perhaps not even human, but someone celestial. She is the person to whom everyone dreams of being in love with, but this particular representation is mine. She is a love that will be with me for all time. But seeing her body here, although she still manages to live up to everything I could ever hope for, she reminds me that she is just human. She is just another person with her own desires, thoughts and feelings. I cannot make her fall in love with me. She will fall in love with me on her own accord. And then, only when she chooses, if at all she does. My own feelings for her are too strong for someone I've never met. All my life, I've wanted to know how it could be that I could get to meet her. But now that I am here, I wonder, what exactly would that resolve, really? What? I look over to the wings. I can see a young man there. I wonder, with no real cause to do so, could he be her boyfriend? Could he be the one that she wants to dedicate the rest of her life to? Could he just be someone who is filling the gap while she continues to search for a true love? Maybe he is no one and she desires no one. I don't know. I don't actually want to know. It's thoughts like that that become too much for me. It's funny because I thought I shared so much with her. I thought I could understand her, that in many ways she could be just like me. Who's to say that I was ever right? And now is the time to walk away. This is the clearest moment of my life. It is time to walk away. I turn around to look back at her, but she is not there. I choke back a cry and stand there, looking at the floor, 
leaning on a bar stool for support. Blank nothingness. I pick up the stool, smash it into my head. I grab my head and slam it into the wall. Once, twice, more than five times, I can't count. Whilst doing so, I scream out her name. It is time to go. And just before I die, William leaves my body. And I step out of Ginger Jeeb's body, the vehicle that has transported me through time into this world that has been developed and created since my death over 80 years ago. This is a civilization now that is much like the civilization that I left. A civilization that has reached its pinnacle after many thousands of years and has nowhere left to go other than its own self-destruction. That is what happened to my own race. I believe that those humans who knew about us were expecting another attack. No. We were very grateful to those humans who did know. They supported us tremendously, in many ways. We would never attack. But they were right. Something was up. We collectively, as a race, as a world, committed suicide. We drove into the sun. There was nowhere left for us to go. Conditions were too cramped in space. Also, conditions would have been too cramped sharing with the humans on Earth. We were exhausted. We could not have carried on to another planet. We had to commit suicide. But life was too stale. Decay had set in amongst the race. It had been there for a couple of hundred years. Depression was set. Nobody noticed it because they thought that was life. Power was unevenly distributed. Nobody could handle power. But the depression really kicked in about a hundred years ago, just before we arrived here. We felt like intruders, though some thought that they liked that idea. The power hungry. No, we committed suicide. It was a joint decision, something that people believed in firmly. They knew that their time was up. They called for it, even though they may not have particularly wanted it as individuals. The story. We were supposed to invade the Earth, to capture it and take it as ours. Why we were supposed to invade it? Nobody really knows why. But I am aware that I had a major part to play in it somewhere, in spreading that message. Things can only take over from there, really. We had, after all, been travelling for nearly a thousand years, fleeing from one dying planet to take refuge on a new planet that we knew would be inhabited. At that time, the civilization of humans was advanced, their technology at a very strong phase. But nobody knew or could really predict the wild evolution of both civilization and technology in the couple of centuries before we arrived, over 600 years after we left home. The advances were incredible. They took us by surprise. This is ignoring the growth of industry from factories to the highly communicative digital era that is now. What is to happen next? We, on the other hand, had faced a devolution in terms of technology, industry, civilization, everything really. I think I've mentioned before how little money we had coming aboard this ship. I think I might have mentioned that there was a lack of jobs. 
A lack of industry means a lack of economy. A lack of economy means a lack of industry. Lack of industry means that necessities are not getting through to the masses. Lack of economy means lack of sciences and advances. Sure, theoretically, we may be incredibly strong in sciences, but we have not been able to build anything to accurately test our theories. So, although we have many grand theories, we do not know if they work. Civilization started devolving. How do you recover when, in essence, there are no real natural resources? We had storerooms full of supplies, but they needed to be rationed. Nearly a thousand years of rationing. How demoralizing is that? And that's what happened. The race became demoralized, aided by cabin fever and claustrophobia. When we reached Earth, there was a lot of propaganda floating about. But a lot of people felt that they had a right to lay claim to the Earth. Had the humans experienced a thousand years of space travel? No. Were they needlessly plundering the Earth's resources? Yes. Could we have made that more efficient? Yes. Would we be doing the world a favor in the humans' eyes? No. Would the humans let us come aboard? No. Would we have to attack? Yes. It was our only means. And then I came along. I felt I had to organize the attack because I was in the right place at the right time. And because I was hopeless at my job. I was just giving the people what they wanted. I was the first Trascon to touch Earth's surface. I was the first Trascon, after a millennia of generations, to step out and breathe air that wasn't recycled, to step out into the open, to let my mind expand, to experience the beauty of the Earth, and actually think for myself. I did not want to destroy, but somebody did. When I came face to face with Ginger, I saw somebody who cared about his planet. Could he have killed us all? No. Would he have tried? I don't know. But he made a pact with another Trascon, one who was perhaps treasonous towards me. But my motives were still seen as wrong by that point. Nobody had realized that my mind was changing. But what I did see was that, regardless of any motives, one Trascon and one human being were getting along, working together, at peace. If one random representative of each race was able to do that, then could we not all? And then I killed myself, as ironic as that sounds. I prefer the way people perceive my death to what my death actually was. People saw it as symbolic of what should happen. My death, as opposition, was like a hint towards the future of humans and Trascons trying to get on. Really? My death was me running away from life, complicated by my own stupidity and forced to face myself every day. I could no longer cope. Seeing Ginger was my way of escape, as well as a means of transport when I died. My death started up a cult. 
based on my own personal reports, people could see a swing of my own mind towards what I believe today. Which is why they believe that my death was so symbolic. It's a sad thing, and not something I guess I could ever be proud of. But people started to accept their fate as A. Never being able to return to home, and B. Never seizing control of Earth. They began to realize that they were forever homeless, drifters that they had nowhere to go that they could ever really call home. My death was the end of the invasion and the start of this new line of thinking. It spread a new wave of depression. People started to believe in the old religions again. My holly was fair old heaven, the sun. This solar system, quite blatantly, had a son, which people linked to Holly being from Earth. People wanted to claim it for their very selves before, like our very own, it would expand and swallow the other planets, Earth included. People wanted a sense of identity. People wanted a sense of freedom. People wanted an end to the oppression. People wanted to be themselves. And now, finally, they did it in the only way that they could. Driving into the sun. Well, it's theirs now. And I hope to go up there when, finally, I die. They did what they needed to do. There were so many other factors, but that, in a nutshell, is what happened. And just to reiterate, for those of you who wonder why I am still here, you have to remember that I died 83 years ago. Ginger was my transport here. That is why he, too, had to come. I came here to meet Holly who would be waiting for me here. Now, I do not believe in destiny, but this is a dying wish. Something that had to happen because it had begun. Not all things finish because they begin, but this did. Because I died 83 years ago. Who knows what momentum pushes the world forward, but this is different whilst obeying those particular rules, I guess. It doesn't make sense, but when I died, I came here, and that is how. I look over at Holly. She is why I am here right now, and in all my dreams, in all my life before and after, I have never seen her look as beautiful as she looks right now. She is standing only over there. This I can accept, for in the last dream I had, she came up to me and told me that she may not be there for me in life, but if I was to kill myself, then she would come to me. Then we would be together. I have no idea what to do right now. Just to approach her, I guess. But my feet are rooted to the spot. Not only that, but there is an unerring sense of dread coursing throughout my body right now at the mere idea of doing so. My mouth is dry. My hands are sweaty. My feet also are beginning to get damp. My stomach is fluttery. I've got a slight twitch and a tremble. This is not the time. The moment will be soon, but this is not the time. Instead, it is just for me to observe. I sit down. I look around. There are many people here. Many people to witness this event. 
Are they all here for the same reason as I? I wonder. Are they here because this is the right place for them to be, right now? Or, as I look over at a number of youths, are they only here because it is something to do of a night? I just sit down, nothing really going through my mind except just observing. Observing people, but more importantly, just observing Holly. I watch her, her entrance, elegant but subtle. She just walks into the room, but her presence for me is tenfold to anyone else in this room. I watch her as she makes her way around the room. She looks sad, but nothing is ever just sad. And, perhaps quite perversely, I want to just observe and see if I can get to the root of her sadness. I watch her. She does not look sad. She has that noble quality about her still, but she does not look as happy as perhaps she wants to be right now. She stands in the crowd, but she is alone. Maybe a friend may approach, and she gains some comfort from this. But she'll stand in the crowd for perhaps five minutes. She'll move away. She may approach her friends, or perhaps she'll go into the secluded private room provided for her. Here, I cannot see. Sometimes she may go to the bar. Alcohol. The unwilling truth teller. This is the time when people become more obvious as the deeper feelings slowly emerge. But she is not around for much. I still sit here and wait. Wait for the right moment. Wait for the right time, the right feelings. But they'll never come. I see her on stage now. She is different from five minutes before. She becomes more aggressive in her presence. Not violent, but just much stronger. Screams and yells, violent, frantic movements. A body that moves out of coordination with your mind, as demonstrated by your falling over. This is you, unleashing yourself. You get joy and satisfaction. That is good. It provides entertainment and you are not afraid to laugh at yourself. That is good. But there is a deeper mind behind these antics. Something else controlling your need to be on stage. You look at me. You see my joy in dancing to what you have to offer. And twice you seem to copy me, just after looking at me. That feels strange, and it feels good. I feel connected. But it is a superficial connection. One that can never be attached. Afterwards, you are calm again more controlled and restrained, and the sadness is morphed back into its first incarnation of the night. Again, you gain comfort from others, but you are alone, even when standing with them. You walk past me at one point. I am sitting again, but your path leads in front of me where I have my legs out in front of me. I pull them in, you hesitate slightly, but there is a thanks that emanates from your throat. But it has a quality of an I'm not worth it quality. No, a resigned quality. People hunt you out. You are always wanted. You appreciate it but you seem not to accept it. Why? Afterwards, I have to leave. 
I take hold of my thoughts. I feel that you are not totally different from myself or even Ginger before me. There is a grand fantasy of life. This fantasy is that people get along, that human nature, with all its faults, is in essence good, that all life's pressures and concerns are merely just background details. The fantasy that states that those people who like you will always like you. The fantasy that states that good things happen. The fantasy that states that you can accept yourself. You seem, like myself, to have accepted yourself, but more than others. So much that you have become so aware of yourself that you want to reject yourself. To destroy yourself. To throw everything away. You chase after the beauty, but it does not seem to exist. There is a romanticism at heart that wants the fantasy to be real, but you have developed a cynicism that states that even if it does exist, it will never happen. But you want it to happen. I want it to happen. That is why I am here right now. I am chasing that fantasy. But this is where issues get clouded, muddled. Is my fantasy going to develop along the same lines as yours? I can only hope, but already that cynic is screaming no. It is time for me to go back in. This time, though, the venue seems different, totally different, but everything else remains the same. Your presence is less than the time before. The room largely empties before your re-emergence, but before this, you seem to be hanging around. You are a lot more confident in yourself. This seems good. A good sign. When you come back, you are showing different signs than before. You interact much more. Your presence is less aggressive, but more joyful. You are more content. And this has its impact on me. I begin to doubt myself. The dream is dying now. It is going away, fading before my eyes. You are stronger than before. Your little jokes with your friends. All eyes are on you. All eyes are definitely on you. Friendly jokes like sticking out your tongue at your friends. This time, my presence is not acknowledged. You go. The lights are on. It is over, but is it? It is, but as I leave, there is a pang of regret and doubt that I am wrong. But I leave, because I do not think I can stay. Everything is over. It is all over. But one thing before I leave. I notice that there are a lot of friends here. They turn to face me, as if out of friendliness. But it is only when I notice their clothes, all with your name on it, that I know they have betrayed me. They are here only to taunt me. I leave, shamed, humiliated, disgusted at myself. This was not how it was supposed to be. Not at all, but then is anything. I have only one choice left now. That is to carry on with the plan and hope that you will be there waiting for me at the end, as promised. But is this why I killed myself over 80 years ago? 
No, it is not. But there is nothing I can do about it. We must all make our choices. The future is just going to be a compromised decision. A democracy where no one will get their ultimate way. I just live with it. You seemed to have learned to seize the day much more. So much more than before, when the idea of seizing the moment seemed brutal, as there was not much to grab onto. I am aware of the simple irony that in trying to define you, I was just really defining myself. But even so, the same template seemed to be attached to you. Never mind. Life is waiting. Life, for the most of us, is years, which consists of weeks made up from days. Time cut into fractions to make it more bearable. Life seems so pointless when put like that. But that is all it is. There is no point to life. Humans and Trascons happen to evolve, and from that they gained a brain which made them think. Desires and fantasies could be put into words. That is all. That is the only thing which makes life seem more promising than what it actually is. People say that the mayfly, which only lives for a day, they say that its life must seem like the equivalent of 70 years or so. Bollocks. Its equivalent is a day. Our day. Its day. The day. Its period of waiting is just lessened. It is only our selfishness that makes us want to prolong the waiting. But why? A lifetime is an eternity. The only definition of eternity is the moment each of us, respectively, is born to the moment when we die. That is the longest period of time that we can ever experience. Our individual lives may make that term flexible, but it is perhaps the only true definition of eternity. Time will go on, but existence is eternity. The universe exists. It will only exist for an eternity. Nobody will see it. I look around me. People have stopped living. But time goes on. Eternity is just moving from one point in time to the next. From that point in time to the next. And so on. How pointless does it sound in those terms? That is life. The eternity of existence. I am fed up of waiting. Let it all be over. Existence is eternity. I don't really know what to do from this point on. But I guess it can only really be time to leave. I know that I'm dead already, in a non-technical kind of sense, but the reason I came here was to die, to leave this plane of existence. I don't really know how to do this. The only option is, I feel, to just kill myself all over again. It seems like the only way. I start to walk. I feel like the easiest, practical option is to find a tall building somewhere. I start to walk. It's going to be quite a distance to the nearest building of respectable height as I go back into the centre of the city. I just look around me. All over the place are just people frozen into one place. As much as I hate to say it, 
This place really has become a ghost town. There is no life here. It is as if this is a world of my creating. They are like me, trapped into stasis before they finally get to go away. And just in case you're wondering, all text was written by me, Daniel's nemesis. Our next book is purely a work of fiction and is not meant to be based on anyone or any events at all. The music was also by me, Daniel's nemesis, as was the image that accompanies this podcast. It sucks, doesn't it? But there we go. 